In the last video, we saw that cellular homology actually does compute singular homology. And this is only, the statement is only good for something if we can now sort of use it by saying that it's easier to compute cellular homology. Yeah? So um, how does one compute cellular homology is um, the question that remains. And um, in this video, I want to make the statement how uh, one can actually make the cellular chain complex explicit and therefore conclude the homology. So it will then still be our task to prove this statement and to do some example computations. But first of all, let's see what um, the assertion is. So again, we fix a relative CW complex X comma A. And if we want to make things explicit, then there's no way around choosing pushouts, yeah, to make everything explicit. So choose pushouts. And let's make this a little bit bigger now because this is essential for all what follows. So the pushouts describing how the n skeleton arises out of the n minus one skeleton. Um, that works like this. We've got a bunch of attaching maps, call them little qi and it will be convenient to also remember the um, dimension in the notation. So these attaching maps go into the n minus one skeleton and these domains here go into the disks. So same index set here and here we've got the n disk and that's the input to our pushout diagram and the output is the n skeleton of our CW complex. And I only um, remind you that we already discussed in a previous video that out of the choice of these pushouts, we obtain an isomorphism of the cellular chain complex of X comma A. And well, give him a name, let's call him nu n. To um, the direct sum of as many homology modules in degree zero of the point as we've got n cells. Yeah? This is um, the isomorphism making explicit the n cellular chain, homo chain module, which we get out of the choice of those pushouts. Okay, so we already know how the objects in our cellular chain complex look like. That's this isomorphism. And the question is now, how do the differentials look like? And this is what we want to answer in this video. And to do so, let us fix now an n cell, which just means we fix some index in this index set of n cells. And let's also fix an n minus one cell. So that means we fix an index in the index set of the n minus one cells. And associated with, with i and j, we can consider the following composition of continuous maps of spaces. Consider the composition call it Fij, because it depends on both i and j. And we start in the n minus one dimensional sphere. And from the n minus one dimensional sphere, our choice of index i here gives us an attaching map. Yeah, so uh, one of these attaching maps here of which we formed the coproduct here is just the attaching map corresponding to i. And that's the first morphism here in our um, composition. So that's QIN, sorry, QIN going to the N minus one skeleton. And now we do the following th thing. We take the N minus one skeleton and we mod out a subspace of this N minus one skeleton. And what is this subspace which we mod out? Well, it's the complement of the open cell corresponding to our index J that we chose here. So we take x n minus one and we take out, and now I shall allow myself to use previous notation. I think we denoted the open cells by E last semester. And corresponding to this index J, we get an open um, n minus one cell in the n minus one skeleton. And we collapse everything but this open n minus one cell Ej here from the n minus one skeleton. Yeah? And then this arrow here is just the canonical projection into the quotient space. Okay, so far so good. Now I claim that um, modding out all but this one open 
n minus one cell actually get a homeomorphism to just well an n minus one cell now a closed n minus one cell mod out its boundary sphere mod s n minus two and this homeomorphism goes in the left hand direction and it's actually induced by the characteristic map now so capital Q of the n minus one cell j yeah so so remember q j n minus one that well these characteristic maps so oh, I forgot to put it down here I wanted to put it here with capital Q so these characteristic characteristic maps of the cells um, occur down here but in this case we are dealing with um, degree n minus one so it would be the same push out where the degree n is lowered by one and this map now induces this homeomorphism meaning um, all points here in the boundary sphere um, they by the push out by the, by the commutative push out square map into the um, into the um, n minus two skeleton I should now say I guess yeah and therefore they do not touch this open cell and therefore they lie entirely here in the in the space that's mod out here and therefore I get an induced quotient map yeah and if you I think it's visibly imaginable yeah if you have the inclusion of this cell and then the cell will form some bubble in your CW complex and if you mod out everything um, outside this bubble then what remains will just be I mean if this if you collapse all of this to a point what will remain is this bubble yeah? and this is sort of um, the homomorph homomorphism what's written here could also make it more precise using the universal property of the push out why one does obtain here homomorphism but since it's visibly so clear I think um, it's not very useful to do that and now finally if we have the n minus one disk and we mod out the boundary sphere then this is actually homeomorphic again to the n minus one dimensional sphere and now of course one can find various homeomorphisms realizing this but we already discussed one in some previous um, videos we introduced a map and I think the notation was u so in this case it would be u n minus one and remember this was this map that you've got a disk you put the midpoint of the disk to the south pole and then you wrap the disk around the globe yeah so that the boundary gets mapped to the north pole and this is um, a map which we made explicit we really put down a formula and it's important that we really use this map now yeah so we have to fix once and for all an identification between this quotient space and the n minus one sphere all right so out of the choice of an n cell i and an n minus one cell j we obtain a map from the n minus one sphere to itself a self map of the n minus one sphere and this allows the following definition definitions in green we define the incidence number green incidence number Oops. as the unique integer and now we should um, note what it depends on so it depends on the choice of this n cell i and the n minus one cell j and part of the notation again it's convenient if um, the dimension is always fixed here and this integer so really element of z it's the unique one with a property that if I consider the homomorphism that fij induces an n minus first singular homology with coefficients in z yeah then this is an endomorphism of an infinite cyclic group and therefore it's given by multiplication with a unique integer and this one is the incidence number so the defining property is that I take the functor h sing n minus one blank z coefficients yeah I apply this functor to our composition fij that I just introduced yeah so now I've got a homomorphism from this n minus first singular homology of the n minus one sphere to itself and if I apply some homology class to this homomorphism 
then this homomorphism must be given just by multiplying this element alpha with some um, integer. And this integer is the incidence number. Yeah? Homomorphism from z to z is given by multiplication with some integer, and this is the incidence number. Okay, so if you want to compute it, you can pick a generate, generator of this infinite cyclic group, and then you apply your homomorphism, and you look at how many times do you have to add, subtract um, the given generator to, um, yeah, to get the image, and the, this number will not depend on the choice of either generator you have chosen. So, yeah, long story short, this is the defining property. We require this for all homology classes, so for all alpha in hn minus one sing sn minus one with coefficients in the integers. Okay, so I think a remark is in due order here. Um, this method of having a self map of the sphere, say the n sphere to make it simpler, and then looking at what um, homomorphism does it induce in n homology and singular homology with coefficients in z, and then getting an integer out of this. This, of course, works in complete generality, has nothing to do with this particular situation, and it's also got a name in this general um, situation. It's called the degree of the self-map. Yeah? So an outcome of homology theory, particular of singular homology theory, is a nice and very interesting invariant for self-maps of spheres. Yeah? For every self-map of the sphere, we get such an integer, and it has very nice properties. I mean, one apparent property is that two homotopic maps, self-maps of the sphere, will have, will have the same degree just by homotopy invariance of homology. Yeah. And yeah, there could be said way more about this, but we shall not do so, at least for this uh, moment. OK, so this defines the incidence number. So. Remember, we've got relative CW complex, we chose pushouts, and out of this we got all those numbers. And I, we can collect now, or we can organize all these numbers now, of course, in a matrix. Yeah. And I call this with capital letters the incidence matrix N of the CW complex XA, just by gathering all those integers in NIJ in a big matrix, yeah? So it has many, as many rows as the cellular, as the CW complex has n cells, has as many columns as the CW complex has n minus one cells. Okay, so we've got a nice matrix out of this and now you can already guess what this matrix has to say on the cellular chain complex, namely, and now I shall make explicit that homology shall denote, shall denote the singular homology. Yeah, but now coefficients in any ring are allowed. Yeah, so not only the integers, any commutative ring here. And in this situation, we have a commutative diagram. saying that the nth cellular boundary operator is just given by matrix multiplication with the incidence matrix. So here we've got the nth cellular homology of x comma a. Here we've got the nth boundary operator, so we denoted it like this in the last video. So let's stick with that, going to the n minus first cellular chain module. And here I'm using now the isomorphisms new n, yeah, so it's important. These isomorphisms are not a choice. So they are now given once this, these pushouts are fixed, yeah? So I've chosen once and for all these pushouts. They gave me these isomorphisms new n to, in this case, i n h, ah, sorry. So I said h star should be singular homology with coefficients in R, so I do know what the zero homology of a point is, it's just R. And here I've got the isomorphism nu n minus one, also coming from the choice of pushouts, going to one summoned R for every n minus one cell in x comma a, yeah. 
and the incidence matrix, which now also depends on the choice of pushouts. Yeah? So all those three homomorphisms depend on the same choice of pushouts. Um, this gives me now a homomorphism between these um, three R modules. And now I have to focus to get it right. Um, so I is on the left-hand side. So there are as many rows as N cells. And I apply an N, yeah. So this should be a, a row vector here. And I multiply it from the right with my incidence matri matrix N here. Yeah, because if I have a row vector of one element of R for each cell, yeah, then I can multiply it with integers. I mean, it makes sense to multiply elements of a ring with integers. It just means as many times as the integers you sum up. Yeah. And then you get another row vector, which now um, has as many entrants, entries as we have n minus 1 cells here. Yeah. And of course, well, the statement is the commutativity. And therefore, we have made um, all differentials in the cellular chain complex explicit in this way. And once we've proven this, we can use this method to make explicit computations and really come up with homology groups of um, yeah, geometrically relevant spaces by applying this method.